Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of our Latin series on restoration, Zechariah, and the passion of our Lord. And in Zechariah, the main order of business is to rebuild the temple. Now, this matters not because of the brick and mortar, be because of what it means. It signifies that God is willing to be reconciled to his people. And just as importantly, it means that the people are willing to take a step to be reconciled to Yahweh. However, just in case it wasn't clear, Zechariah repeatedly reiterates that repentance, trust, and commitment are what Yahweh is really hoping for. That's kind of a week one review. Um, last week, Zechariah had a vision in which Joshua, the high priest, was in court before the Lord, and Satan was the prosecutor. As a priest, it makes sense. Joshua was representing Israel before Yahweh in this vision, but unfortunately, he was in filthy rags, not fit to stand in the courtroom of the Lord or in the presence of the Lord. And so Satan was making all kinds of accusations against Joshua and God's people, the Jews. But uh, the messenger, it says angel, but it, the word is messenger, and uh, it seems very likely that this messenger could be, in fact, Jesus. This messenger of Yahweh who guides Zechariah throughout the visions in this book and helps him understand them, rebukes the devil and says, Joshua's name says it all. And the name Joshua, which is the same name as Jesus, really, means God saves. And you might say Joshua had been joshua -ed. God had spoken this man's name, and uh, the, the messenger says, Joshua's name says it all. The name Joshua means God saved, and God has saved his people, and through his people, he's going to save them by reconciling them to God. Then God says, or then the messenger says, you can't say anything else, Satan, and he gives Joshua clean robes. Joshua is, the point is, Joshua is appointed by Yahweh, as this new high priest, he's legitimate. And despite their guilt, God will be reconciled to his people in this new temple. Well, chapter 4, where we're at, focuses now on a civic leader, the governor of the returning exiles, Zerubbabel. Part of the reason Zerubbabel was chosen was because he was from the Davidic line. So he's a legit, he's got the potential to be the king. Just like Joshua had the right pedigree to be a high priest, Zerubbabel had the right pedigree to be king. Even if, you know, his authority and reign were clearly nothing close to a king's. But still, Zerubbabel was the leader of the exiles, even if it wasn't the most enviable job in the world to govern and oversee a building project among a small group of endangered transplants in hostile territory. If you've ever been involved in a building projects, you know they are no small task. Uh, my dad uh, was a YMCA director for years, and he was inv involved in, in several building projects. Uh, he didn't do the actual building, because he's a YMCA director, but he fundraised and planned for it and oversaw additions, and in some cases, even whole new YMCAs. Uh, this was probably a lot like what Zerubbabel was doing. I talked to my dad, and he said that uh, many people uh, don't realize a project doesn't just take care of itself. There's any number of ways in which things can and will stall if you don't keep pushing things along, motivating and keeping people on task. And uh, my brother-in-law, who's a, a foreman, would say it this way, there's always field adjustments. The job is never done until it's done. When you take all of that into consideration, Zerubbabel needed all the support he could get. Unfortunately, Zerubbabel faced a lot of challenges. He had limited workers, funds, and uh, resources, materials. The project was growing wearisome at this point, and many of those who were involved in the project were sort of wavering in their commitment. Plus, uh, even worse, there were doubters and opponents who were actively campaigning against the project and questioning Zerubbabel's qualifications, apparently. Opponents were probably saying things like, he can't do it. 
He doesn't have the moxie or the materials or the manpower to pull it off. Probably other nations or groups were mocking, what kind of king is Zerubbabel? He's weak, an international afterthought with no power. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. I imagine that Zerbear himself was getting frustrated with all these hiccups and setbacks. So to encourage the project and Yahweh sends a vision to Zechariah, helping the people to see where things are going and encouraging both leader and workers. And the vision that he sees is the vision of a gold lampstand with seven candles on top of it. Probably much, well, these are very nice, but probably uh, an even nicer version of something like this. There's one thing, but then there's seven candles on top of it. But um, instead of having to refill the lamps, with lamp oil. In the vision, the lampstand is constantly fed by two olive trees with channels feeding olive oil directly into each candle. I'm sure our altar guild members would love to hear no refilling necessary, right? Well, you may not be sure what this means, so let me enlighten you at least the basics. The lampstand stands for God's temple, partially because lampstands like this were used in the temple and tabernacle. And the temple and the tabernacle stands for the reconciliation between God and his people. God's temple will be completed, Yahweh says, because God is sustaining the efforts and his people. How will this temple be completed? Well, Zechariah tells us. It's not by military might nor by power, but by my spirit. And sometimes this is translated as not might nor power, uh, but I'm relying on the authoritative LCMS uh, uh, guy on this uh, um, who, who came here and shared, and I'm trying to, no, his name's escaping me, but he wrote the commentary on the book of Zechariah, and he says this is really not just might, it's military might. It doesn't matter, in other words, how unimpressive it might look to the naked eye. The temple project will be finished. Zerubbabel may not have a standing army, a full treasury, or even an impressive construction team. Nevertheless, the task will be completed, and Yahweh is the man because Yahweh, or, and Zerubbabel is the man because Yahweh has made him the man in charge of this project. And, um, the, the two trees stand for the leaders of God's people, in this case, the high priest and the governor, Zerubbabel. And the oil could stand for the spirit of Yahweh, which keeps the whole thing going. Well, there's more to be said, but we don't have time. So we'll focus on that phrase, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And when we look at the world, wow, is that a different way of doing things. Usually, might makes right. You know, one side crafts legislation, the other side tries to stop it. Whoever wins, whoever is stronger, gets to make the decision for the state. That's how it is, and it's only a slight exaggeration to say that that's mostly how it's been throughout history. No wonder Jesus told Pilate on trial, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. When asked if he is in fact a king, Jesus replies somewhat evasively, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. I think that we can take a lot from that. The church is not called to be in charge or to make everyone do what we want. Rather, the church is here first and foremost to testify to the truth. And in John's gospel, which is what we're reading, the truth is Jesus, whom we testify to. And we may be belittled and mocked or even attacked for doing so, but it's important to remember that the state doesn't have to be Christian in order for Christians to be like Christ. And that is our most important calling. See, the church does not die and rise depending upon which country it is in or who is in power. Rather, the church dies and rises with Christ and by the power of the gospel. See, God is fully capable of providing for us, 
sustaining us and leading us no matter what is going on around us, just like he did for Zechariah, Joshua, and Zerubbabel. Not by might, military might, nor by power, but by God's Holy Spirit. And therefore, our, our focus and energy is first and foremost upon listening to the Spirit, and not necessarily as much upon might or power, particularly within the church. The small catechism says, uh, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it in the one true faith. In other words, it's God working through word and sacrament and the Holy, power of his Holy Spirit who calls us, who keeps the church from falling apart and makes us holy. Now, for those of us who might grumble that we'd like to see something more impressive, some more drastic changes in how effective and vibrant the church is, well, Zachariah's advice might be for us. Don't despise the day of small things. See, Zechariah is talking most specifically about despising the unimpressive Zerubbabel and temple project. But he's also speaking to us when we look at God's work in our lives and in our congregation. Don't despise when God does something small, like change one person's life, calls one sinner to repent, baptizes one child or adult into the faith. Sometimes I admit it, I despise the day of small things. I'd like to see God do big things. I want to see big numbers in our pews, big numbers of people checking us out online. I repent because I too depend sometimes too much upon success that can be seen. I too am reminded, don't despise the day of small things because God works in ways big and small and it's often the day of small things that makes the biggest difference. I mean, how small did Jesus look, lacking food, sleep, and blood as he hung upon the cross? What kind of king did he look like, even less impressive than Zerubbabel? I mean, Pilate saw him as a non-threat. The crowds mocked him as a wannabe king. He was opposed and attacked, hanging on the cross. He didn't have a leg to stand on. Brothers and sisters, do not despise the day of small things. Do not scorn the cross, but rather repent and trust in what God is doing in Christ our Lord as he is revealed, uh, as he is hung upon the cross. Marvel that the glory and power of God was being revealed in the suffering of Christ on the cross. We have been saved through that cross after all, and he will sustain us as we continue to testify to the truth of the gospel. We certainly pray that God would move among us, and perhaps we ought to pray that he would not send us might or power, but his spirit. Do not despise the day of small things, the single prayer, the tears of one repentant sinner, or the faith of a single soul. Rather, rejoice that the Holy Spirit is at work among you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.